the next um, party withstanding that we will be requesting to the podium are uh, the Canadian Feminist Alliance for International Actions and Partners Canada Without Poverty, and the representatives are Sheila Day and Dr. Palmiter. If you could step to the podium, please. Thank you. Okay. Quay Nin Deloisi Pam Palmiter. I'm from the sovereign Mi'kmaq Nation on unceded Mi'kmaq territory in the Atlantic provinces. It's a privilege to be here on the unceded sovereign territory of the Algonquin Nation. I want to thank the elders for opening this in a good way, honor the medicines that are here, and uh, thank you to Maggie Sywink and all of the families uh, who have been advocating to get us to this place. I'm speaking today as the Chair in Indigenous Governance at Ryerson University. Uh, on behalf of the, our partners, the Canadian Feminist Alliance for International Action and Canada Without Poverty. Together we have standing as a group to appear before you and deliver our oral submissions, which will be followed up with our written submissions. We also wish to thank all of the Indigenous women and girls and their large community of human rights allies for their time, energy, hard work and persistence to actually get an inquiry. It was uh, a significant feat and we honour and acknowledge the commitment of those women to protecting and advancing core fundamental and basic human rights of Indigenous women and girls to live a life that is free from racism, sexism and violent misogyny. However, we cannot just pay lip service to Indigenous women and girls and families. They actually have a legal fundamental right to the truth in law. The right to truth is actually recognized by all major international and regional human rights systems, the United Nations, Inter-American, European and African systems. It's a legal right. Families of victims of violence have a right to quote, know the truth regarding the circumstances of enforced disappearances, the ongoing progress and results of any investigations and to know the fate of their disappeared person. And as part of that right to truth, states have a legal duty of due diligence to fully investigate and publicize all of those findings, to publicly acknowledge the wrongdoing and commemorate events, and to provide reparations for victims, move beyond commemoration and put, try to put people in the place where they would have been. As the United Nations Secretary General Ban Ki-moon explained, knowing the truth offers individual victims and their relatives a way to gain some closure, to restore some element of dignity and heal. But getting to the truth of the victims and the families is not just a legal obligation. It is a fundamental part of all of our human dignity. And what is the truth of murdered and missing Indigenous women and girls? Well, the truth is, Canada is in the midst of a full-blown human rights crisis of its own making. Over time, colonizer settler governments have literally built an infrastructure of violence that is maintained and sustained by laws and policies. It is a complex and interconnected system of laws, practices, policies, actions, and omissions that put us in this crisis. It treats First Nation, Métis and Inuit women as lesser human beings who are sexualized, racialized and treated as disposable. 
the message that Canadian society gets is that Indigenous women's lives are far less valuable. And it's all because of their gender and indigeneity. And this infrastructure of violence didn't evolve naturally. It's not an inevitable result of the meeting of two cultures. It was created and maintained by colonial governments and all of their agencies, and it is reinforced in every aspect of society. And that is very clear. It was to clear the plains, so to speak, to take our lands and resources while facilitating settlement and trade for their economic benefit. And our women and girls have paid the price. The infrastructure of violence remains firmly in place today and manifests itself in high rates of violence, exploitation, rapes, disappearances, murders, all experienced by Indigenous women and girls and even babies. And although all governments in Canada have agreed to the National Inquiry and they've agreed that there is a crisis to be addressed, every single federal, provincial, and municipal government are still active perpetrators and perpetuators of the violence. And it doesn't matter how many programs they list or how many initiatives they list, they have not taken the steps to end violence against Indigenous women that is embedded in their systems. Of the known murdered and missing Indigenous women just from the RCMP review, we know that there's 16% represented nationally. But in provinces like Manitoba and Saskatchewan, the rates are 49 and 55%. It shouldn't shock anyone in this room that those are the same two provinces that have the highest rates of kids in care, the highest rates of Indigenous women and girls in prison, the highest rates of police shootings of Indigenous people, and some of the highest rates of unfounded sexual assault cases. These things cannot be treated as individual issues. More often than not, these numbers, while shocking, don't tell the whole story because Indigenous women and girls simply don't bring all of their claims forward. This is something we know. And of those that do to police forces, of those that do make it past the barrier of police who are resistant to investigate, they have patchy and inconsistent data, which makes it very difficult, if not impossible, for us to understand the true scope. We're essentially just seeing the tip of the iceberg. All indications are that the numbers are markedly higher than what is being reported here. Colonization and the current colonial governments and structures, which are admittedly, self-admittedly racist and sexist, have combined to form a lethal form of misogyny that targets Indigenous women and girls in horrific ways. And there's a historical underpinning to this crisis that is incredibly important to know, but this isn't a legacy. This isn't the aftermath. This isn't just trailing effects. This is what's happening today, just under different names. And these historical and current practices include the treatment of Indigenous women as sexualized commodities by European settlers, Indian agents, and the police, the legalized construction of First Nation women as property of men through the Indian Act, who could not transmit status in their own right, the expulsion of First Nation women and children from their own communities because of state-imposed gender discrimination, the theft of lands and resources, forced relocations, disassociation from our traditional cultures, languages, and the removal of our voice in politics and decision-making processes. The history of removing Indigenous children from their mothers and families to put them in residential schools or scooping them for adoptions created the situation that we have today. The current practice of apprehending babies from Indigenous mothers or removing them from their mothers at birth to put them in non-Indigenous foster homes without consideration for not just the impact on the child, but the mother. And there is no worse form of violence that you could do to an Indigenous woman than to rip her children from her. Forcibly and coercively sterilizing Indigenous women in order just to access their kids in foster care, the underprotection and over-policing of Indigenous women and girls, sexualized violence by people in police and corrections who, when in custody, Indigenous women and girls are raped, 
beaten, harassed, and denigrated by state enforcement officials. The failure of the justice system to punish all of these perpetrators of violence unless they are a famous serial killer. But we have very few punishments for doctors, lawyers, teachers, social workers, next door neighbors, and police officers. And this government created crisis includes crisis level socioeconomic conditions, which act as an effective blockade from Indigenous women and girls being able to escape violence. It leaves them with no options. And all of this has been created under Canada's numerous and infamous worldwide human rights laws. Few countries could actually claim that they have more human rights protections than Canada. Yet we have this crisis of murdered and missing Indigenous women. Over the last 70 years, Canada has put in a framework of numerous rights and rules, human rights and Indigenous rights, which are human rights. They exist in every jurisdiction. You can't discriminate on the basis of race and gender in anything. You have the charter right to equality, life and security of the person. And even our constitutional Aboriginal and treaty rights are guaranteed equally between male and female people, in theory only. In practice, those laws are not enforced. This framework of rights includes international and regional human rights treaties and agreements that Canada has been ratifying since the end of the Second World War. Numerous human rights have been set out in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights that guarantees basic human rights to freedom, equality, and dignity and rights, life, liberty, and security of the person, a standard of adequate living for health and well-being, medical care and necessary social services. And these rights are internationally understood to be indivisible, interdependent, and interrelated. They've been further elaborated in numerous international conventions, including the Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, uh, the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, and uh, the Rights of the Child and Persons with Disabilities. Canada is also bound by the Inter-American Declaration on the Rights of Man and the Charter of the Organization of American States. We could go on and on and on. These are things that Canada has signed on to and committed to. And most recently, Canada has said that it offers full support for the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. And so the important thing about UNDRIP is that UNDRIP, the very first provisions of UNDRIP, incorporate and implement all of those international human rights obligations into UNDRIP. And that was a choice made by Indigenous peoples who were the ones that drafted UNDRIP to make sure that they, as individuals and collectives, get the benefit of all of those international human rights protections. That's important. The other thing import that's important in UNDRIP is that the state has a legal obligation to protect Indigenous women and girls from all forms of violence and discrimination. And Canada has told the world at the UN General Assembly that the world expects Canada to adhere to UNDRIP and human rights standards, and we expect that we'll do that too. Well, what we expect is more than nice words, more than accounting of programs and initiatives and promising practices. We expect nothing less than the full compliance with the human rights protections for Indigenous women and girls that we chose to be a part of when we included those in UNDRIP. After all, this isn't about politics, it's not about ideologies, political parties, or popular opinion. This isn't an issue as to whether every single Canadian agrees that Indigenous women and girls have human rights. This is the law, and the issue is about whether or not Canada is abiding by the law. And our lives depend on it. And here's the thing. Canada already knows all of the problems, and they know all of the solutions. To not act, to my mind, is a crime. International human rights bodies have been calling on Canada to act on this crisis for more than 25 years. It's not like we just found out about this in the last couple of days. But despite all of Canada's good words, and despite all of the ceremonies they participate in, they have done very little to substantively stop the violence against Indigenous women and girls. Most of their initiatives are after the fact.
The 2006 report of the Special Rapporteur on Violence Against Women said Canada has legal due diligence that requires governments to prevent violence in the first place, protect women and girls from violence that may be ongoing, punish those who perpetrate the violence, and make reparations, make amends for what has happened to Indigenous women and girls. In other words, if there is a specific group of, of women and girls that are known to be at risk to violence, like Indigenous women and girls, Canada has a legal obligation to set up effective mechanisms to prevent further harm going forward. And we know throughout this national inquiry how many of our Indigenous women and girls have gone murdered and missing, exploited, in prison or in foster care, just while we're talking about this. After Fafia and NWAC requested thematic briefings at the IACHR, they launched an investigation into murder to missing Indigenous women and found that we can't cherry pick recommendations. You have to have a comprehensive holistic approach and that you will never be able to address violence unless you address all of the root causes of it. This includes past and present institutional, structural, and legal inequalities faced by Indigenous women, the dispossession of our lands, and the devastating social and economic marginalization through effective measures to combat poverty. Nothing less will address this violence. In 2015, CEDAW issued a report finding that Canada had committed grave human rights violations against Indigenous women and girls. Canada, not Mexico, not the other countries that people look to when you talk about disappearances of Native women, but Canada, because it failed to establish legal protection of their rights, failed to refrain from engaging in ongoing acts of discrimination, and failed to take every appropriate measure to eliminate discrimination against Indigenous women. The CEDAW committee also found that Canada has engaged in systemic, multiple, and long-standing violations of all of the human rights of Indigenous women and has breached all of its obligations in international law. There is not a single human rights obligation that Canada has not breached when it comes to Indigenous women and girls, and that's quite a record. Even here at home, Canada's own Auditor General found that consistently, Canada fails to implement the recommendations that would make the most profound differences and improvements in First Nations lives. Instead, they cherry pick. Let's have a new computer program. Let's do some new reporting. But they continually fail to improve their lives. There's a recurring theme here in our submission. Canada not only created this crisis, but it continues to get worse because of Canada's ongoing failures. It is making policy and legal choices not to act when they know they have to. The crisis of murder to missing has always been about Canada's failures. It has never been about any inherent vulnerabilities on the part of Indigenous women. Indigenous women and girls are strong, resilient, and powerful people. We are grounded in the love and wisdom and beauty of our cultures and our ancestors. We're the heart of our nations. And while many have tried to lay the blame on the victims for engaging in so-called high-risk lifestyles, we know from the statistics that the highest risk to an Indigenous woman or girl is being born female and being born Indigenous. That's the high-risk lifestyle they have. And this crisis stems from Canada's racism, sexism, and discrimination <clears throat> against Indigenous women, which directly causes their disadvantage and marginalization. Canada has sent a clear message to everyone in society that Indigenous women and girls are less worthy. And society has heard the message. Perpetrators of violence target Indigenous women and girls for three reasons. They are Indigenous, they are female, and they can. They have a near 100% impunity rate for things like human traffickers. And that is on Canada. That is not on us. Nothing about this crisis is our fault. None of it. And I think that needs to be very clear to Canada. But the impact of Canada's failures is significant and profound. And we don't have the time to go through all of it, but we have some examples. Sex discrimination in the Indian Act, 
has been with us since 1876, which has targeted Indigenous women for exclusion from their communities, including their descendants, and treated them as second-class citizens. The 1985 consignment of Indigenous women who married out to Section 61C instead of men under Section 61A has considered them as lesser Indians, lesser parents, and denied them the full social standing in their own communities. The exclusion from status has obviously excluded them from federal programs and services, as well as First Nation programs and services, but it's about more than just that. Lack of access to their territories, lack of access to their elders, language programs, being able to go to school on reserve, um, all of those things because of status. The Government of Canada has amended the Indian Act three times because Indigenous women have taken Canada to court and won every single time on gender discrimination and they keep being told to remove it and they refuse to. The most recent amendment under Bill S3 was the Trudeau government's opportunity to live up to all of their promises that they made to us in the history to finally remove gender discrimination under the Indian Act and their response to us was someday. That's why we're here today with murder to missing Indigenous women, because our rights are maybe someday. In the 2014 report on murder to missing Indigenous women by the IACHR, they found that Indian Act sex discrimination is a root cause of high levels of violence against First Nations women on reserves, but also in society. The CEDAW committee also found that the Indian Act has been enforcing, reinforcing and maintaining gender discrimination against women and girls for more than a hundred years with no signs of stopping. They recommended that sex discrimination be eliminated from the Indian Act many times over. Even the United Nations is aware of this and Canada has not acted. But the violence will never stop until we are treated as equal human beings. And it's pretty simple and it's pretty fundamental. And it is a minimum threshold for trying to eliminate violence. But because of all of this, Canada has also created gross socioeconomic conditions at rates much higher than the Canadian population and grossly disproportionate to Canada's wealth. It's one of the wealthiest countries in the world, but it's Indigenous wealth that we don't have access to. A shocking one in four Indigenous children live in poverty. 60% of First Nations kids living on reserve live in poverty, but in provinces like Manitoba, that's a staggering 76%. Instead of improving, poverty rates continue to grow worse for First Nations children year after year. And it's directly related to the poverty of their Indigenous mothers. A third of Indigenous children live in homes headed by single Indigenous mothers, and statistically, they're more likely to be poor. They suffer from high rates of um, uh, lack of access to water. There's more than 174 drinking water advisories as of May 2018, despite all of the provinces, uh, promises to remove them. Uh, they live in, 28% live in overcrowded housing, 43% are in need of major repair, 15% should be condemned, and upwards of 90% of all of the homeless people that live on the streets are Indigenous peoples, many of them Indigenous women and children, who don't dare ask for help or their children will be taken from them. In terms of health, Indigenous women and girls have the highest rates of mortality in Canada, six times the national average, and they have the highest rates of heart disease and stroke, when in Canada, the rates of heart disease and stroke are actually declining. If we acted today, if Canada meant any of its fluffy words, and we did all of this today, it would take 28 years to close the education gap, 63 years to close the income gap. So to say this is urgent is an understatement. Indigenous people suffer 10 times higher the suicide rate, but Indigenous women specifically have the highest rate of suicide attempts, and the number of kids in care have even higher suicide attempts. And this crisis-level impoverishment of Indigenous women and girls is linked to their historic and ongoing 
dispossession from their lands and resources and ongoing breaches of their Aboriginal and treaty rights and title. Despite the fact that they have constitutionally protected treaty rights to fully funded education, health care, and even uh, critical provisions like food, clothing, and income supports. Treaty 6 specifically provides emergency relief in times of poverty. And we've been in times of poverty since contact now. Treaties 1 and 2, the Treaty Commissioner promised that the Crown would provide, through the treaties, a future of promise to live in comfort and live and prosper and provide, just like the white man, for all future generations. We are nowhere near that. And despite the many calls by First Nations under their treaties for aid in this urgent situation, none has come, especially when it comes to Indigenous women and girls. And the former Special Rapporteur for Indigenous Peoples, James Anaya, said very specifically in 2014, it is difficult to reconcile Canada's well-developed legal framework and general prosperity with the human rights problems faced by Indigenous peoples in Canada that have reached crisis proportions. Year after year after year, people who study what's happening in Canada note that it's a crisis, but no crisis level action is taken. It's the same old programs and initiatives. Poverty and marginalization prevent Indigenous women and girls escape from violence. Nothing short of a radical and targeted intervention that is crisis level is needed to address these socioeconomic conditions for Indigenous women and girls. But all of it is tied together. If we look at how socioeconomic conditions feed, literally feed, the child welfare system. And the child welfare system is itself a pipeline to murder to missing Indigenous women and girls. Then we know just how critical it is. With every policy decision, Canada is killing our people. Indigenous kids in foster care experience higher rates of sexual and physical abuse. It's a direct line to youth corrections, increased risks of sexual exploitation, human trafficking, and sexualized violence in general. We know that Indigenous women and girls make up no less than 50% of all human trafficking victims nationally, and those rates increase when you look at it on a provincial basis. And the police have long recognized that human traffickers target foster children and group homes. Yet where is the corresponding emergency action to provide protection? Indigenous children in foster care are more likely to end up in youth corrections than they are to complete high school. This not only diminishes their life chances through no fault of their own, but it also diminishes the life chances of mama because little concern is ever given for Indigenous mothers in these situations. Indigenous mothers who lose their children are far more likely to suffer from anxiety, depression, substance abuse, and suicide. There is an insidious link between child apprehensions and forced and coerced sterilization of Indigenous women. At every turn, Canada's targeting of Indigenous women targets our life-giving abilities and our bodies. Governments in all jurisdictions, every single one, are guilty of discriminating against Indigenous women and girls and committing this violence by removing thousands of children from mothers, families, and communities, underfunding child welfare services on reserves, using funding formulas that incentivize removing children, failing to provide adequate prevention and supportive services to Indigenous families and to Indigenous kids in care, providing higher rates of financial and other supports to non-Native foster parents than to the actual parents to whom these children are a part of. No, no equivalent amount of funding or supports for Indigenous birth mothers, grandmothers, aunties, cousins, community people that take in foster children, apprehending babies at birth instead of taking care of their babies? How can you be presumed to be guilty? A fundamental aspect of our law is innocent until proven guilty. You have hardly have committed a crime by having a child, but for Indigenous women and girls, the Canadian state determines whether or not we're worthy enough to have children.
They force and coerce and bully Indigenous women into sterilizations. They treat Indigenous mothers whose children have been taken away in discriminatory, denigrating, and disrespectful ways to such an extent that many Indigenous mothers won't even fight because they are treated so horribly by the system. Failing to protect Indigenous girls in state care from physical and sexual abuse. Failing to protect Indigenous girls from police intervention, police arrests, and incarcerations, and allowing state care, foster care, and group homes to function as a conduit for Indigenous girls into prostitution, sexual exploitation, child porn trading, sex trafficking, disappearances, incarceration, torture, and death, all funded by the state. This is nothing short of uh, genocide when considered under these standards of the UN Convention on the Prevention and, Pri uh, Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide. But it gets even worse because who do you call? Who do you call? And the last people I would call would be the police forces in this country. There is a long and documented history of racism and abuse towards Indigenous peoples, not just in the justice system, not just systemically, but by individual men. In 1989, the Royal Commission on Donald Marshall prosecution said that the justice system failed Marshall at every turn because he was Native. The Aboriginal Justice Inquiry said the justice system has failed Manitoba's Aboriginal people on a massive scale. Helen Betty Osborne was abducted, beaten, and murdered because she was Indigenous and a woman and because they could. The 2004 Saskatchewan report says that racism in policing is a major obstacle to healthy relations with First Nations. The Ipperwash Inquiry said Cultural insensitivity and racism is not restricted to a few bad apples, that it is widespread in the Ontario Provincial Police. But here's the thing, racism in policing towards Indigenous women and girls creates problems not just of over-policing and under-policing, so higher rates of arrest, incarceration, excessive use of force, uh, disproportionate numbers of deaths in police custody, but they also fail to call when come uh, to, to come when called in emergencies or domestic violence. They fail to open up investigations, or they do incomplete or incompetent police investigations. Of all the people killed by police in Saskatchewan, 63% are Indigenous, yet they only represent 15% of the population. The number is 58 in Manitoba. In provinces like Quebec and Nova Scotia. Indigenous peoples killed by police are 10 times their proportion of the population. But for Indigenous women and girls, racism in policing is compounded by sex discrimination and how sexual violence against women is viewed and treated by police officers just in general. We know that in Canada, more than 20% of all sexual assault claims are dismissed as unfounded or baseless. Seven provinces or territories have unfounded rates between 25% or 32%. Some cities have unfounded rates of 51%. However, for Indigenous women and girls, this intersection between racial and sexual discrimination combines to form a unique form of racially targeted and sexually violent misogyny against Indigenous women and girls committed by police officers. Not only are Indigenous women and girls less likely to have their claims of sexual assault taken seriously by police, but they have the unfair and added fear of police committing sexualized acts of violence against them themselves. Police as perps are nothing new. Human Rights Watch has issued several reports already in Canada, and Indigenous women have testified that they don't trust the police because, quote, they either rape you or arrest you. What does that say about Canada? The fact that a police supervisor permitted a police officer to take an Indigenous woman home who he had arrested and put in prison for drunkenness because his boss said, and I quote, you arrested her, you can do whatever the fuck you want to do with her. That is the state of policing in Canada. We would like to say it is one or two bad apples, one or two serial killers or monsters, but it is not. Human rights reports and others have tried to bring action against uh, 
abusive police practices, but the police forces, more often than not, rally together behind the thin blue line. They, their police chiefs, police unions, and local politicians, A, deny it's a problem. And when confronted with very specific allegations, like the ones in BC with numerous RCMP officers raping Indigenous women and girls, the head of the RCMP emails their entire fleet, or whatever you call them, my message to you today is don't be worried about it. I got your back. Keep doing the great work you're doing. That's horrendous. This brotherly solidarity works to ensure that there is no accountability for sexualized violence committed by police officers against Indigenous women and girls. And there are thousands of cases of police sexualized violence against women in general, including their own colleagues, which has resulted in class actions, but also against Indigenous women and girls, including using their database to find, locate, and stalk individuals, physical assaults, sexual assaults, sexual exploitation of young girls, actually engaging in human trafficking, and in the trade and manufacture and distribution of child porn. These are our police forces. And these reports explode the myth that we are dealing with a few bad apples, but it is something far more prevalent. It should be no surprise then that over uh, Indigenous women and girls are also over-incarcerated. They are, in fact, the fastest growing prison populations. They are primarily incarcerated for crimes of poverty or defending themselves from violence, and they pose the least amount of safety risk to Canadian society. Right now, 40% of all women in federal prisons are Indigenous. In provincial prisons, that number goes over 60%. Most shockingly is Indigenous girls represent 53% of all intakes into youth corrections, but in Saskatchewan, that number is 98%. They expect in six months for it to be 100%. How much higher do you go than 100%? When do we call that a, a, an emergency? And where do all of these Indigenous women and girls come from? Well, the ones in prison, 91% have suffered sexualized violence, a fifth came from residential schools, and more than two-thirds came from foster care. We don't have to be mathematicians to know what that formula is. So we have many recommendations uh, in our written submissions about all of these other um, issues, but the one that we're going to focus on today is a national action plan to end violence against Indigenous women and girls. We believe that in addition to all of our other recommendations on these specific issues, that Canada must engage in a coordinated strategic national response that matches the scope and severity of the human rights violations perpetrated against Indigenous women and girls, and that this response must at its heart address all of the root causes on an emergency level. This national action plan must be based in human rights, and incorporate international human rights standards, which include Indigenous rights. This plan must ensure a maximum available resources dedicated to enhancing current programs and services and establishing new ones. It must set measurable goals for improvements in all socioeconomic indicators and justice system indicators, and most importantly, violence indicators. Clear timelines must be attached to all of these goals. We cannot have a national uh, action plan that is about objectives and aspirations. There must be measurable progress. It must account for differences in realities between First Nations women living on and off reserve, Métis and Inuit women. And because the federal government is the national government, they should use funding transfers to provinces and territories which are legally conditional on the implementation of all of these plan elements and their legal commitment to engage in coordinated strategies, public reporting and monitoring. It must also include substantial needs and Indigenous rights-based funding to Indigenous women's service groups and their home communities and governments to implement human rights in their own communities and address these issues, including Indigenous rights, and be full partners in any solutions at the national and regional level. 
no tables, no advisory groups, no consultants, no research assistants, but indigenous women need to be at the table in equal partnership making the decisions. The funding must be conditional on detailed reporting, evidence of substantive reduction in violence, and improvement of the conditions of indigenous women and girls. You don't do that, you don't get the funding. Right now at Indian Affairs, they fundamentally breach their only mandate every year, yet they still get paid to do the same thing. Their mandate is to improve the social and economic conditions and they have failed that every year since existence. We need to do things radically and fundamentally different. The federal government must develop a mechanism for coordination and collaboration between all of the province's territories, municipal governments where relevant, but most importantly, Indigenous women, their organizations, and their home communities to identify what they need in their own words. Canada has to take a leadership role and not use the constitutional division of powers as an excuse not to act. Because if there has ever been a national emergency in this country, the crisis of murder to missing Indigenous women is one of them. Indigenous women know best what is needed to end violence against them. And the key principle of this approach is to put Indigenous women's verses first. They must be in all leadership and decision making. This plan must be proactive, have an independent review mechanism to make sure that it's monitored, evaluated and adjusted. adjusted. It must ensure complete and full and equal participation by Indigenous women in their organizations and include a rights claiming mechanism somewhere where Indigenous women can go and address all of the human rights and Indigenous rights that aren't being addressed, that is accessible. While we have many other recommendations, nothing short of a comprehensive, radical national action plan, which is specifically focused on Indigenous women and girls, not a generic national plan on gender or a generic one on Indigenous peoples, will be the only way to address long-standing, deep-rooted racism, sexual, uh, sexualized violence against Indigenous women and girls. What's happening in this country is nothing short of genocide in every aspect of the definition, from killing Indigenous women and girls, to creating physical harm, preventing births, transferring children, and creating the conditions of life that would destroy them as a people. Canada has numerous legal obligations to stop this, and that's our respectful submission. Commissioners, do you have any questions? Thank you, uh, Dr. Pomander, for your submissions as well as uh, your colleagues. Um, I have two questions. Um, first, with respect to your assertion that what we're dealing with here is genocide. How important it is, is it that we make that finding? It would be one of the most critical findings you could make because it would dispel the myth that we're acting with good intentions, but oops, things are just going wrong. If Canada didn't know what the problem was, if they had no idea what the solutions were, that would be one thing. But it is the state who has created and maintained it and fails to act. That is a consciousness of mind. And that changes everything, not just us and Canada and the international community, but in society, to know that this isn't us, this isn't our fault, we are not defective, this is something that Canada is doing to us and it's killing our people. Thank you. With respect to the um, tenth point on the National Action Plan, a rights claiming mechanism, um, one of the standing Inuit um, has suggested that the establishment of an Indigenous Rights Commission or Indigenous Human Rights Commission and Tribunal is required. Um, is that something that you've, they've submitted a proposal um, to the government 
with respect to the implementation of UNDRIP, and that was a key element in their proposal. I'm not sure you're familiar with it, um, but it outlined the need for that, and it resonated, that submission resonated with your submission. And I was wondering if you had thoughts on the establishment of such a body. Um, well, the one thing about our National Action Plan is that we're also advocating that it be flexible enough to adjust for regional or provincial differences and also differences between the needs of First Nations women, Métis women, and Inuit women. Métis don't have the same statistics as Indigenous women, for example, or First Nation women, and the Inuit have very acute and unique circumstances in the North, not necessarily uh, the, replicated in the South. So I think, you know, the Inuit women would advance in that particular thing, but our national action plan is is more than a human rights commission uh, where you where you claim your rights. It's also this national monitoring body, reporting body, um, very comprehensive about all of Canada's international human rights obligations and Indigenous rights obligations, whereas tribunals tend to be provincially or regionally focused, and that might work very well for the Inuit, but we're thinking about something much larger scale. I believe the proposal is a national um, tribunal as well. Okay. Um, because you, you asked, you stated very eloquently, and we've heard it everywhere, who do you call? Where is the recourse? Where is the recourse? So um, I look forward to reading more about the rights claiming mechanisms in your submission, and thank you very much. Thanks. Uh, Dr. Palminer, I don't have any further questions at this point. I just want to say thank you very much for your submissions and I want to acknowledge your colleagues that are with you as well today. Thank you. Thank you. I too want to thank you, but first to thank you on behalf of Commissioner Audet, who has made it very clear to me that I am to say thank you uh, uh, for your uh, very, very eloquent submissions. Uh, she said, um, also, she's anxious to read your, your submissions. Okay. She's dictating to me right now. Oh, okay. <laughs> Via text. <laughs> and I'm translating at the same time. Yeah, um, and she agrees with the need for a comprehensive approach, as you've described. Uh, and yes, Michelle, it'll make sense. <laughs> thank you. Uh, I want to thank you as well, and especially to put this in uh, the um, the state that we're in right now as a crisis that re that requires an equally critical response. Mm -hmm. Because I'm reminded of how quickly, swiftly, and thoroughly governments will respond to snowfalls and ice storms, and yet um, we are where we are. So maybe I should leave it at that. Thank you for putting it in that perspective for us. Uh, it's been uh, uplifting to listen to you today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you to your colleagues. And uh, I look forward to reading your submissions probably many times over. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Chief Commissioners, Commissioners, we'd like to uh, request a lunch break at this point, but again, if I could just address one housekeeping issue. I just want to remind any of the parties withstanding that have made submissions today that at the end of the day, we will be having an honoring song so that if, I know some parties have to depart or, or catch flights, but if you're available at the end of the day, we will be inviting you up for an honor song. And on that note, I'm going to request a one hour lunch, please. It's, uh, it's just about 10 after 12 right now, or five after 12. Will the parties for this afternoon be able to start early? Yeah, no, we, I, I can't show you. Yeah, definitely the uh, first party up has just indicated to us that they will be available to start it from w once lunch, okay. once we come back from lunch. So if I could request lunch, it's uh, till one ten for one hour. Let's say one fifteen. It's an even number. Okay, thank okay. you. One <laughs> fifteen.